All right, y'all, welcome back. We're looking at the history of Australia. This is from History with Hilbert. This will be linked down below. Probably should have been done like at the beginning, but here we are months and months into this. I have hundreds of videos and I am finally doing the history of Australia. Just going to see a good layout of some brief history of the land down under. This is only a 23 minute video, so of course uh, there can only be so much packed in here, but I'm pretty excited to see what's going on. Let's do it. So this video is the entire history of Australia. I hope you enjoy. The ancestors of the indigenous population of Australia, called the Australian Aboriginals, were one of the first groups of people to leave Africa in search of a new homeland. They did this at some point from 65,000 years ago to wow. 49,000 years ago, with some estimates putting the first humans in Australia at 125,000 years ago. That's incredible. Which is... That's really long. <laughs> in fact, really the first ago. Australians are so old that at the time they were coming into the new continent and making a home there, there were still Neanderthals running around in Europe. On the chart of wow. old things, the first oh Aussies God. really are right up there. Now, the first Australian. I have heard that before that some people think like the oldest human beings were basically down here in Australia. That's very incredible, and, and honestly, I believe it. Australians would have come into the continent through Southeast Asia, and yeah. it's thought that they would have used islands to go island hopping until they managed to get to Australia, as crossing an ocean was very difficult, especially in this era before sail technology. The Australians who first came into Australia would have had a different situation than today, because back then sea levels were a lot lower, which allowed people like the ancient Siberians to cross over the Bering Strait into the Americas, as well as peoples coming into Australia to cross into Australia and New Guinea, as New Guinea and Australia are linked together by what's now the Sahul Shelf, which is underwater back then because of ice ages wow. and different sea levels. Right this here. was all above water, and there was a continent called Sahul, which they could walk over to get to Australia. Oh, Today's Aboriginal population of Australia is most closely related to the Papuans from New Guinea. And a very interesting thing about both the Australian Aboriginals and the indigenous population of New Guinea is that they share somewhere around 5 to 6% in some cases of their DNA with another subspecies of human called the Denisovan man who originated somewhere and lived in Siberia and they must wow, have bred what? and intermingled with this other species of human when the aboriginals were coming into Australia through the landmass of Sahul when they lived in Guinea in Papua and the Papuans have a slightly higher than the Aboriginals. They have slightly higher DNA from the Denisovan man, which again suggests that this theory of the movement into Australia is correct. That's mind-blowing. Wow. Now, as well, when Aboriginals came into Australia, they Holy were sharing smokes. the continent with Australian megafauna, oh, which are these God. huge That's things wild. like, uh, I think, woolly rhinoceros and things like the <laughs> giant kangaroos, as well as other things. And one Is that the uh, thylacine down here? down here right i believe so look at these giant kangaroos and whatever those are and you can see uh some men back here wow what a wild time what a wild time Jeez. one very interesting thing about the aboriginal art is it's some of the oldest art on earth and i know you're meant to be careful when you're saying art with aboriginal things but i'm just going to go for it um and actually some of the wall carvings which are possibly the oldest in the world are thought to show these giant emu like creatures called genyornis no and they were essentially three times as large as an emu oh and my you can God, see that they are they... absolutely massive and they I have been they drawn were. on I the walls so the first then. aboriginals to come into australia were inhabiting a really alien landscape and it again goes to show how long ago this was yeah let me just say something real quick australia to this day is very unique it's you know it's its own continent it's the largest island and it's so isolated that to this day it's so different than arguably the rest of the world you know each region each continent has its own flair of course but Australia is the most different. They still have all these vegetation, animal kingdom that is just so unique that nowhere else shares at all. It's crazy. And if you really think about it, even back then when the world was way different and there was bigger things going on, uh, crazier animals in the whole nine yards, it must have been insanely 
different back then, of course, compared to the surrounding areas once again. Uh, so that it, it's, it would seem very intimidating to come to Australia and, and not know anything about it. And it also speaks to how I would assume how amazing survivalist uh, the first peoples coming here must have been. I don't know how they did it. It's if we look incredible. at a language map of the Aboriginal languages of Australia, we see that one family, the Macro Pamanyungan languages, is much larger and covers most of the Australian subcontinent. Yeah, it does. Whereas in the north, you have a collection of other smaller languages being spoken. Wow. Now, there are hundreds of Aboriginal languages, and these are simply the yeah, larger language right? families. Now, if we look at this and we see that in most of the subcontinent, one language is spoken or one group of languages languages is spoken and then we see in the north that many are spoken it would suggest some sort of colonization in the north and actually if we look at the dna of aboriginals we also find something very interesting now australia the aboriginals are very diverse and there are many different groups with many different customs and languages as we've just seen but actually if we look at the dna we find that especially in the north certain groups have a very small amount of east indian dna which is thought to be from around 5,000 years ago. Now, there are two explanations as to how it got from Eastern India to yeah. Australia. One explanation says that the genes were simply slowly transmitted right from oh, one place to another yeah. through the East Indies onto New Guinea and then into Australia by simply bumping the genes along with each generation. Whereas the other theory suggests that there would be a direct yeah, migration from India to somehow. Australia. And although both theories have their advantages and disadvantages, it is interesting that one of the northern groups, the Warlpiri group of Aboriginals, has some of the highest East Indian DNA in them today, and their language is also rather different to some of the other Aboriginals. So it's interesting to see what would have happened then with this influx of DNA. And despite which theory is correct, it doesn't matter because it still means that there was some form of mixing with the outside world because the genes had to have come to Australia somehow. And, but apart from this, Australia and the Aboriginals remained very, very secluded and isolated from the rest of the world, which has given rise yeah. to such an interesting and diverse group of languages, peoples and customs. That's what's fascinating. Now, it's actually also at this time, yep. about 5,000 to 4,000 so years ago, that the dingo, the Australian wild dog, comes into Australia. So this, again, would perhaps suggest a migration of some kind. It's in a similar time frame that new tools start to be introduced and used in Australia. And about 4,000 years ago, which is also in the same sort of time frame, it's thought that the ancestor of most of the languages being spoken by the Aboriginals, the Palmanyungan languages, that that was created around 4,000 years ago. And then it expanded, which could explain why it had become so important and so widespread throughout Australia. However, there is hardly a genetic trace of these migrants. They've been called ghost migrants before and ghost people because they left a profound impact on Australian society with the new language that was being spoken by most of the Aboriginal peoples, new tools being introduced, new animals like the dingo being introduced. And yet, genetically, we find very little evidence. Contrast that with the Anglo-Saxon migration when the language was changed, when new customs were brought over, then you do find a massive genetic imprint on the English people. Yet, the Aboriginals, there's hardly anything there, which is really interesting. But how could a situation like this have arisen? And why isn't there more of a genetic trace for such an important migratory group that had such a profound impact? Where did they come from? And where did they go? One theory would be that there was a changing climate and that the availability of resources meant that new technologies had to be developed. Say that one animal species died out, then the Aboriginals would have to move on to get a different food source and they would have to develop new technologies to do this. Another possibility is that there was language evolution through climate change, which was... It makes you wonder how weather was over the course of thousands of years, especially in Australia. You know, I, I don't know much about the whole world's weather over that co course of time. Uh, not even the Americas, really, other than I know at one time there was an ice age, right? Of course. And a lot of North America was uninhabitable or, or covered in ice. And then... At, at other times, you know, all the way down to our southern United States was covered in water. And, of course, now it's not, right? So I know there's 
there's wild weather changes uh, that can happen throughout time. And I wonder if Australia was always really hot, if it went through some cold periods. And of course, with you know sea level always rising and falling, depending on the era, there's just so much variety. And you wonder what kind of uh, weather and climate changes happened and forced some evolution, of course. But again, we backed up by the first theory. Now, there's been a very interesting study into this. I'll make a video about this in future, about how different climates generally tend to see similar sorts of languages in tones and how many consonants are used. And it's possible that if 4,000 to 5,000 years ago there was a shift in climate, there could be a shift in language. Although this doesn't really explain why there is so much throughout most of Australia and, you know, all these diverse little pockets of language families up in the north. That's an interesting As well, thought. it's possible that the population... Especially because, as he mentioned, there is a lot of diverse language just in, like, the northern tip of the country as opposed to the whole rest of it. So uh, what is the reason for that? ...increased to a critical mass, and innovation would then have to be going forward because if you've got the maximum amount of people for the lifestyle, the hunter-gatherer lifestyle they were living in, they would have to adapt to new situations to the larger population, as pretty much most of the Aboriginals didn't live by agriculture. They were hunter-gatherers, so of course you can only sustain a much smaller population without agriculture. For the rest of their history, up until the arrival of the first Europeans in the 17th century, it's thought that Australia's only other contact to the, the outside Dutch, world correct. might have been with Makassan fishermen from the East Indies who would trade with some of the Aboriginal tribes in the north. But apart from that, they were completely isolated. It is interesting wow. again to see that's an, that's in the incredible. Aboriginal art that they depicted this. And after this, the next people they would find in boats would be the first white people they would ever clap eyes upon. Now for the rest of this video, I'm not going to be talking about the Aboriginals. I know that Aboriginal history doesn't end when the Europeans come in. They still went on, they still endured, and Aboriginals are still around today. And I'm going to make a few dedicated videos to different aspects of their history and culture in the future. But to be honest, this is the Aboriginal history that I find most interesting and I hope you found interesting as well. Very interesting. Whereas the rest is really rather depressing. Um, as is with many native histories yes. uh, after the arrival of Europeans. That's the terrible part, right? Eventually I want to learn everything, uh, but I know there's some horrible dark times that arose. But I tell you what, I'm very fascinated uh, by, by this, the first part of the video, the very ancient, thousands of years ago, history of Australia about the Aboriginal people and how they migrated there and their insanely rich and fascinating culture. I mean, supreme survivalists and hunter-gatherers uh, to survive literally on their own, isolated. I think it's out of this world. I think it's really fascinating and impressive. And it's really cool to see the different styles, the different languages, and to see how it evolved. Which is a shame. But I'm, I'll probably make a few videos about that topic as well. But do keep in mind that I've got a lot of history to talk about in this one, a lot of different things, and I hope I've given a pretty good hearing to uh, the part of uh, Aboriginal history that I find most interesting, which is this early stuff uh, in the video. So yeah, no more Aboriginals in this video. Okay. Great first start to the video. Yes, the Dutch, that's what I thought. They oh, did come the first. Flag again? horizontal stripe flag let's go to my most trusted source of information <laughs> see the anthem oh in why the dutch discovered australia I'm first going to have to look a little bit at the context of the VOC, the Verenigde Oost-Indische Compagnie, or the United East India Company. Mm. Now, the VOC had a headquarters in Batavia. Isn't that like, like the richest company of all time in history, if you're talking about centuries and centuries? Someone can uh, tell me if I'm wrong down below. I think it is, though. <laughs> yeah, which is now called Jakarta in Indonesia. And from Indonesia, they had to travel back to Amsterdam and the Netherlands and vice versa to get to uh, the Spice Islands, to the Dutch East Indies and the lands beyond, which took a very long time. Yeah, that now, there was, like luckily route. enough, a very clever and very good seaman called Hendrik Brouwer. And Hendrik Brouwer discovered a current 
and where the wind is very strong, very strong westerly winds called the Roaring Forties. And essentially, if you went down this lane and you were going from west to east, then you would get a massive boost because you've got this wind in the back. And remember, this is the time of sail, so you needed a good wind, and this would really help with shortening the voyage. So he invented or discovered what's called the Brouwer route, which is then instead of going around and up Africa on the other side and across and around India to get to the East Indies, you would instead go from the Cape of Good Hope, which was a Dutch um, uh, replenishing station for ships, you would go straight across the Indian Ocean at 40 degrees latitude which is where the roaring 40s gets its name and then once you got to the Amsterdam islands you would go northeast and head for Jakarta or Batavia as it was called then however it was very easy to if you did miss the Amsterdam islands you would keep going in that easterly direction and then you would crash into the western coast of Australia and wow, this happened okay. to a lot of Dutch Feose ships. And it's true that this happened to a very famous case, uh, the ship being called the Batavia. And the Batavia was shipwrecked off Australia's western coast in 1629. And it's quite famous because the survivors started to murder each other once they were shipwrecked on an island off the western coast. Although I do believe My that God. some managed to make it out alive. However, not all of them died because it's very interesting in Western Australia, you have Aboriginal peoples with much lighter skin. Wow. Or, well, some of them at least, some with blonde hair and other traits of Europeans. And these, as well as having stories told by the elders that there were Dutch mariners, are the descendants of probably Aboriginal women and Dutch mariners who uh, survived being shipwrecked and then were integrated into the Aboriginal communities. So that's another interesting thing wow. there. Wow, that's different. Now, they weren't the first Dutchmen to get to Australia and in fact the first Dutchman to set foot or the first European even to set foot in Australia was Willem Jonsson in 1606 in Dang, his ship called the Daufkin of which this is a replica. This is also the first map that was ever made of Australia, although only a tiny part no of kidding. it was mapped. It wouldn't be until ah. a little later that the Dutch were able to make another map. See, see what it did there? It's called Abel Dussman. Able to make another map. <laughs> wow, nice. The Dutch name for Australia, which comes from the Latin for southern land, Terra Australis, was New Holland, named yeah, after the Dutch provinces right. of the same name. Ridiculous, right? <laughs> Just remember that its neighbour is still named after a Dutch province. Or did you think it was named after a Danish island? Some of the Dutch names for the <laughs> islands in the region were then New Hollands, which was Australia, Nederlands, India, which is today Indonesia, New Guinea, which is New Guinea, and New Zealand, which is New Zealand, and still is. Very fascinating, I didn't know that. Yes. Oh, jeez. Thanks to a boom in the British Very population the in the Brits 1740s, many people grew up and lived in dire poverty <laughs> in Britain's cities. Many punishments were inflicted upon people for committing crimes related to poverty, and many people were either killed or sent away as convicts. Now, in the beginning, most of these convicts would be sent to the Americas, to yep. Maryland and Georgia, which were both British penal colonies in the right. Americas. But after the 1770s and 80s, when America became an independent country, yep. the British needed somewhere new to send their convicts. So, in 1788, they set up the first penal colony in Botany Bay in Australia. And this is essentially where they would send the people who committed crimes where conviction was a po Bot Botany Bay? I wonder where that is. Maybe on, is that on the East Coast? Like New South Wales area, maybe? Or Victoria? I'm not sure. Or is that on the West? I don't know. Possible punishment. Sounds like it's on so the East. So many people were sent over to so. Australia as convicts, which is what I made the little joke about in the previous video. Now, there are a lot of amazing stories of people who made really interesting escapes. For example, William Buckley, who is shown here, who escaped from the penal colony and went to live with an Aboriginal tribe. And this image actually here wow. on the right Look is a drawing made by an Aboriginal man from stories told down about his escape and how he came to live with them. Although he That's very fascinating stuff like that, stories like that, right? Look at that. Wow. ...did later on become reintroduced into Western society after he was pardoned. 
Yeah, I don't know the whole history with the penal colony at the beginning, like how the prisoners, you know, how it was for them, where they were, how life was. Uh, I assume it wasn't great. I, I don't know. I, I'm sure there's videos on that specifically, so I would like to react to that and learn about that uh, very soon, uh, more on a specific, you know, subject, have its own video. But it doesn't sound like it was probably very good. I mean, if people uh, like this man wanted to escape and uh, luckily get taken in by the Aboriginal people that from, he found. From uh, obviously escaping and from the crime which got him convicted in the first place. Another interesting escape is the Kapla escape, which is when, and I'll pronounce it right this time, thank you to whoever it was who uh, corrected me in, in a previous video, uh, when Fenian Irish rebels uh, escaped from the penal colony when uh, it was a whaling boat sailed right the way from Great Britain to Australia, picked up six Irish prisoners and made a dash and getaway. Uh, the Fenians and Irishmen were quite often uh, a large group of the convicts in Australia because Ireland was rebelling a lot at this time. So many. Well, of course they were. Come on. You know the Irish aren't the biggest fan of the Brits, right? Come on now. <laughs> What's funny is the joke is on the Brits because. They, I mean, think of a crazy empire that's so big that they just pick a whole continent to say, oh, this is going to be our, our prisoner colony. <laughs> wow, you're making a whole island that's already inhabited, by the way, uh, your own prison, basically. And uh, joke's on them because it turned into a really big, wildly popular country today. But of course, not without some really messed up and bloody history. Yeah, it's just a weird, weird situation. For sure. We're Irish. Now, something else related to this is the 1804 Castle Hill Rebellion, in which many of these Irish rebels instigated a rebellion against the colonial government. And at a battle that was called the Second Battle of Vinegar Hill, the first battle of Vinegar Hill had been fought in, I believe, the 1798 rebellion, Wolf Tone's Rebellion in Ireland, uh, and like that first battle, the mostly Irish convicts were defeated by British uh, colonial forces there. Now, there weren't only at this stage convicts in Australia, there were also free settlers. And actually the free settlers really didn't like the fact that so many convicts were being sent because it's like having a huge prison as your neighbours, except they're just walking around pretty much freely in the landscape. In 1851, yeah. gold was discovered plan. and a gold rush happened in Australia. So lots of immigrants oh, came yeah. in from various countries. Quite a few Americans, Chinese and British immigrants came to mine this gold and hopefully mm. get wealthy. And this really helped to boost the Australian population, especially because it wasn't just convicts who were living there. Initially, the relationship between all these miners and the British colonial government in Australia wasn't very good. The colonial government wasn't very happy with all these people coming into Australia. They feared that this would bring about a lot of lawlessness, which it really did, as with the miners in California in 1849. <laughs> now, the what West. they did was they forced the miners to get a mining license, which would cost them money, as well as hindering them in other ways. So many of the miners started to rebel. Now, the relationship went from bad to worse when a Scottish miner called James Scobie was killed in the Bentley Hotel and the murderer was acquitted. Now, the rebels gathered outside the Bentley's hotel and they burnt it to the ground. The rebels formed the Ballarat Reform League and swore allegiance to the new flag which showed the Southern Cross. Mm. This could, if it had been successful, have been the start of an Australian revolution and it's often heralded as something that was the start of democracy in Australia and a revolution for the people and by the people. However, the rebellion was crushed at the Eureka Stockade which the rebels had put up and uh, the British were triumphant over them and the, the rebellion collapsed. That was an interesting transition. <laughs> British colonial rule, Australia was made up of several states and territories, each with a different colonial government. Now in 1901, the British allowed the Australians to vote for federation, which would mean centralisation under one government, an Australian government, and which would then lead to independence. In 1901, the states did indeed vote for federation, and Australia became an independent nation in its own right. What's interesting is actually that for a while, Fiji 
and New Zealand were also included as part of this. New Zealand was for wow. a while simply an extra part of New South Wales. But no in the end, New Zealand didn't hold the vote for federation, which is ultimately why it's not a part of Australia today. Wow, that's now, interesting. in the First World War, the Australians nonetheless fought beside their British and Allied counterparts against the, Al the Central Powers. Now, the Australians and New Zealanders made a part of the Anzac Corps, which was especially famous for its service in Gallipoli when the British and other Allied forces tried to attack the Ottomans through the Dardanelles Straits, but which ended in failure despite the best efforts of the Anzacs. Now, this next part isn't really a thing that's talked about often with Australian history because it's just such a horrible thing that no one really wants to bring it to discussion. Now, it's been known by a few different names and one is the Australian Civil War because it really was a conflict, a terrible, oh, dreadful conflict where I I know brother is. fought against feathered brother. <laughs> so i am just like to have a few moments to Amuse. all the people involved in that awful, awful conflict. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's messed up, man. Despite being defeated in the Great Emu War of 1932, the Australians were able to hold the expanding Japanese imperial power at bay in the Second World War and help the Allies to defeat the Axis. Alright everyone, so thank you very much for watching this video oh, man, which has been about quick. the history of Australia. Yeah, that was pretty interesting. Uh, about as much as you can fit in a, you know, 23 minute video when you're talking about thousands of years uh, but I thought that was very interesting that was history with Hilbert please make sure to check it out in the description uh, down below if you would like to watch this and, and look into it further on your own hopefully we get a lot of comments on this video tell me your thoughts down below I know there's a lot of bits and pieces I'm sure that had to be skipped over because you can only fit so much into here uh, but I learned a little bit it was very interesting to get some more accurate timelines and, and eras you know into my head that that make more sense because i just never have really done a straight up history of australia type content or video australia people always ask me you know what what's the deal like how come you react to australian stuff you know why because it's fascinating uh maybe you don't notice that if you're living in australia but you know the world is huge and there's so many land masses so many countries but i'm very fond of the australian people uh, I know that I've made so many friends in our awesome community, and so I'm just fascinated by it. Australia is very unique. It's very isolated. It has, like I said, so many unique landscapes and weather, ancient history. It has, it has fascinating people, new and old, uh, cultures, new and old, languages, origins, and, and, you know, even talking about nowadays, it has awesome, like, you know, fascinating sports and motorsports and car culture and cities you know like the most beaches in the world and all these different things it's very interesting place very fascinating as unique and exclusive as australia is it also shares some connections well for me as an american there are certain things that are familiar but different as an american when you look at australia you know it's a similar size it's very big like in the united states and you know they do share some similar interests in things like you know, similar sports, but with their own flair. Uh, Motorsports, you know, very similar, again, with their own flair. Uh, landscapes, for sure. You know, cold zones and very hot deserts and stuff. So the United States and Australia share things like that. You know, and I'm just brushing over. These are very generic, but you get the point. Uh, it's for anyone that always asks, you know, like, why are you so fascinated with it? Because how could I not be? There's so much to be fascinated about. So uh, please throw a thumbs up on there. Boost the video and the algorithm. I appreciate that. Uh, subscribe for more stuff like this. Check out the description for this original video from History with Hilbert. And, of course, other ways you can support my channel. Leave your comments down below. My name is Ian. You're watching IW Rocker. Until next time, guys. I'll catch you later.